Um, so, uh, Peter, Peter, Emily, and Sriba. Uh, Sriba, we, we cannot see you, but if you want to turn on your video. Um, well, I wanted to take some time with the three of you and, and really look at the, the topic of, of acquiring these works and get all your guys' expertise sort of together and on a table. And, uh, and I'm also encouraging the audience, if you want to ask questions around acquisition, now is a, a good time. Um, but so before, just sort of opening up that, that the floor. Um, so this, this architectural model that, that Emily also showed in her presentation and that we spoke about in the, in the beginning, I remember that for me, this was a really pivotal moment. Like this was some sort of epiphany where, you know, where, where I could feel there were parts shifting in my brain and opening up new, new sections. Did, did you guys have a similar experience working with 3D printed artworks? I don't know, maybe Emily, you wanna start? Yeah, I can, I can share my recollection of that, uh, of that process. So, um, so I remember, you know, we had been talking about this a bit in the museum and had visited some other print studios, but I remember this, this was the first time we actually had a print made. And when I went to the, um, the place that was going to print it, it was fascinating because it was the first time I was a client. And as, as soon as I walked in the door, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and I had asked for a tour and they had agreed, but you know, weren't terribly interested, I think, in, in what we were doing. And as they were showing me around, like everything was covered, you know, I, I had signed an NDA, but there's honestly nothing I could disclose because of the proprietary nature of all of this. And that was a real eye-opening moment for me of, you know, going to other studios like more in an educational context or, you know, with artists or makers. I love talking about it. And this was just that reminder of like, oh yeah, this is a multi-billion dollar industry where a lot of the knowledge is proprietary. And that, that really changed my perception around um, approaching work and all the legal issues related to it. Um, <clears throat> should I go next? Um, yeah, I guess from uh, like my end, uh, there, the, the Auerbach um, case study, I think was a real you know, pivotal moment um, uh, for myself and, and I think Megan Randall as well. Like I still remember um, the conservation staff meeting where she was talking about it. And I was like, oh, you know, I'd be interested um, in getting involved with that, knowing that they had to reprint objects and things of that nature. Um, and it was interesting because it was it was a unique example where I mean just talking about Emily's experiences with the proprietary nature of like this huge industry is um, Tauba. It was the first time she had ever used the process, and so and she's a very like open and, and very lovely person. So she was a, a really great collaborator with us to kind of help us figure out things with this piece as we had questions coming up. Um, but it it really I think informed our practice and really made us aware of how it can um, enrich the collection. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm speaking specifically about, you know, Paola mentioned we had acquired works prior to this. There were 3D printed that I had just basically ignored. I was like, these are objects, um, you know, that's this the domain of the objects conservators. Um, but now going through this whole hour back um, um, process uh, or case study um, really revealed how um, we need to all be collaborating and, you know, get these, you know, printing files and how they, what utility they can serve in documenting the collection and just sort of um, bring us together and working more collaboratively and more sort of like how we can all sort of team up in the care of these objects, I think is really what um, is the, one of my biggest things that I did, came out of um, this specific instance, this, this case study. Sriva, did you have a, a moment where you felt like, I don't know, some things was falling into place or something? Well, I, I would say that in my role, I primarily work with a lot of um, objects and artworks that are um, two-dimensional. And so, uh, well, they're two-dimensional images or renderings of, of what could be three-dimensional objects. But I am learning more about uh, the use of 3D printed material. Um, uh, in artists' objects and their artwork, and also um, in in regards to the stewardship 
of museums and caring for these objects and really understanding, um, you know, what the process will be into the future of how we can maintain or conserve uh, these objects in the collection. And, and sometimes it's really interesting to hear about the artist's, pro well, it is very interesting to hear about the artist's process too, because I think having conversations between museum and artists and creators, it can really, uh, it can create more questions and uh, just create a new, new ideas around how we collect and how we conserve and how we preserve um, artwork objects. So being a part of that process and a part of those conversations um, to really understand what it is, what it means, what it looks like into the future um, uh, and possibly being, uh, being able to foresee into the future, of course, we don't know perhaps all the things that could come up um, as far as technology goes into the next uh, 30, 30, 40 years from now. Um, but it is always very interesting conversation, always an ever mm -hmm. great conversation. To mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Meredith uh, Sharp Noyes asked in the text, uh, in, in the chat, how, what, what are, what are co conservation considerations when acquiring when we acquire works that deteriorate, like how can we sort of reconcile with that? And, and maybe I want to sort of piggyback on that question uh, or as a follow or as a follow-up question, is, is reprinting even a viable conservation strategy? Who wants to go first on the easy question? <laughs> I can, I can start talking and we'll, we'll see where that goes. Um, so I would say, I think of reprinting as just one tool in the toolkit. It's not, you know, it's certainly not the end all be all. It's a rare thing for, uh, in, in moving forward, I think it'll be a rare thing. But um, I think where it can be interesting is with these more iterative works like for the architectural model that um, I did talk about, it was designed to be made at different scales. And that's a really interesting um, potential within the work where I think um, I, I would find it very sad if for works like that, if a museum just said, no, the work has to exist only as these kind of sad little yellow bits of plastic and that's it. Like it's, it's an expansive work in its conception. So I think it can be interesting in those cases. That said, it's a tool, but it's not the only tool. Um, we have some great other tools that would be really helpful for caring for these works, including the basic stuff like working with an art shipping company to prevent the shipping damage that you know prompts some of this discussion. Preventive care, um, you know, those those are great places to begin. Um, I've also had some issues interesting conversations where people have asked about reprinting for things that kind of like fall in the normal domain of what a conservator does, like some little parts had fallen off and um, someone thought maybe like, oh, does this need to be reprinted? And we can, we can handle that kind of thing. Like we can put broken parts back on something. So some of it's just interesting to see where people's sense of what's possible with objects. Um, the bigger question, it seems. So what do we do? Oh, I want to read actually this question again now that I've <laughs> now that I've talked for a little while. So it's it's what should we do with things that um, are maybe more in the ephemeral range or realm that aren't expected to have uh, infinite lifetimes? Um, well, I would say uh, this is not new territory, I think, in, in contemporary art um, or, yeah, in cultural heritage. Um, and there are so many benefits to still acquiring works by, um, you, you know, for things that aren't expected to last. One being like support of an artist, um, name recognition, also funding, um, especially like in an artist's emerging period of their career, and just like a, a a vote of confidence, like a support for what the artist is doing. Um, and I think that it's, 
I don't know, the classic example being Ava Hesse, like you just needed to make the work that you needed to make. And yes, it didn't last or didn't last in the same way that it was when it was first made, um, but wouldn't change anything about a practice. Um, and certainly wouldn't, yeah, that's, that's a whole other, other conversation. But my, my point being like, there are real benefits for these works still being in a collection. Um, they can still be accessed by researchers or scholars, um, even if not exhibited. Uh, and again, the support of the artist is really important. So that's where my mind is. What, do you, what other folks think? Um, so I think Emily, I mean, Emily is the object conservator. So uh, 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 the better person to talk about um, sort of the preventative major measures and protecting the objects themselves. Um, but I guess just this whole idea of, um, you know, something that's going to have a finite lifetime. I, I just go back to things in terms of the reacquisition conversation, you know, it's just being very upfront and just having these very frank conversations with the artist or creator and being like, this thing's going to go away at some point, you know, especially this material um, that uh, deteriorates so rapidly, um, or, or some of it does. Um, and really just discussing that and just getting their thoughts on how they feel about, you know, should we reprint? Um, you know, is this just the object sort of having those conversations, both with the artist, but also within your institution um, to see how everybody else, you know, feels about that while also taking the measures um, to sort of hedge against that. And I'm looking at uh, Mark Heller's question about um, you know, Nary Oxman who prints in like pectin and chitin, like how are we um, going to reprint that? And it's going to be pretty hard. Um, so I think we hedge where we get the files, we try to document as much as we can about the process, knowing that it's going to be pretty impractical in this present moment for us to reprint, but maybe, you know, in the future, it's very common, you know, who knows what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years. Um, so we just sort of hedge our bets in a way by trying to gather as much um, documentation and as much um, sort of uh, ancillary material around the object, um, you know, through these conversations, through like this is all like documentation, but sort of metadata in a form um, to just help describe and sort of contextualize and then give, you know, our um, successors uh, um, the tools to, to deal with it um, you know, down the line with the technologies that we don't even know about um, that could potentially extend the life of, of these works. Yeah, from a, from a right point of view, just looking at, you know, if there is a, an agreement or, or some kind of agreement between the artist, the artist's estate and, um, and the collecting body, you know, we can put language into our agreements that can speak directly to that process of conservation. And, you know, in the event that materials start to deteriorate, this is how the museum um, can um, make reproductions of that material or be able to conserve the material or um in some cases artists are like part of my work and i think mary oxman is a great example of this is that my work is supposed to deteriorate over time and um we we do not want to see it being um kind of a reproducer or manufactured in a way to conserve it back to its original state so it really does um you know depend on of course, the artists and what their intentions are with the work, um, but also getting if the artist is living, really having those that dialogue to understand how do you see the work um, into the the future, a um, mm -hmm. hundred years from now. Like, how would you want this work to be preserved? Or um, maybe ten. Yes, or maybe ten exactly, because as we know, technology is is a fast moving target. Yeah. yeah. Shreva, can I give you a follow-up question? Um, does, since, so when the museum goes, you know, or is planning on reprinting an object that has been degraded and now, so the, the institution is planning to recreate the object. Um, and and if, there's, if there hasn't been any sort of wording in, in the contract, do you advise, um, not officially, uh, do you advise to, to put that in writing that that the, the the museum is now undergoing a reprinting effort ahead of time. Yeah, I mean it, it is always, you know, in my work as, as much as possible, creating language around what we can see, what what is foreseeable into the that we can can possibly uh, draft an agreement around. So these are the issues that we see. Um, and how can we include language in an agreement that would cover 
um, any foreseeable issues around the preservation of this work. So, and in some cases, in many cases, there is no agreement or, or the museum hasn't had an opportunity to talk directly to the artist because our artist has passed or for whatever reason is unavailable. And I think in those cases, it's really, um, you know, it's a, it's a dialogue that needs to happen internally. And, and I know that many, uh, many museums, as of MoMA included, we have, uh, you know, a team media, a group of uh, colleagues from throughout the different uh, departments of the museum, uh, of course, curatorial, exhibition design, technical, media, we come together and we talk specifically about these matters, um, particularly where an artist may be unavailable to speak on their behalf. Um, hopefully there's a representative that we can work with um, to have more conversations about uh, how how the museum can steward the work, but I think it, it's a very it's a very interesting question <laughs> that comes up, and 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 how do we how do we work how do we work these details out when we don't yeah. have yeah. Yeah. all the yeah the information? So yes, as much as we can uh, from a legal point of view, we definitely try to include as much <laughs> language yeah. and agreement that can cover these bases. Yeah. Thank you. I have, oh, yeah. can I just make one brief little plug regarding Mark's question about the Neri Oxman piece with the biodegradable materials, just a little plug for the exhibition in the spring. There's a very interesting um, update on how they're handling those things. So visit us at MoMA in the spring to see that show. Yeah. Um, we're, we're at the end of our time and I see an extremely interesting question in the Q&A from Tatiana Cole about looking at the reprinting of uh, contemporary photographs, uh, and maybe we can pick up that question later. Maybe, Peter, you've been asked a question in the Q&A. Can you give me a 30-second answer on how to catalog these objects when they come in with the, the, on the digital, if you have digital files coming in, if you have objects come in, if you reprint the object, how do you, how do you sort of bring that into a cataloging system? Yeah, um, to really quick, I'm going to make this super fast, but to answer Tatiana's quickly, yes, 100%, we look to other uh, mediums, so um, reprinting photographs, film print, um, I think just looking at sort of uh, practice-based decision-making, uh, I think really trying to inform looking to other disciplines about how they've handled it in the past to form this particular um, case study. So yeah, 100% looking um, to other uh, disciplines and what they've done. But um, in terms of the cataloging, we look, so it's alongside it. So I gave the example of um, we at MoMA have these X components where there's one component for the object, another component um, uh, that would be an X2 uh, for the digital file. And then if we were to reprint, it would be an X3. So it would sit alongside it. And then what we would do is just tie the relationship together within our collection management um, database to be like, this came from this. This is why we printed this um, and sort of just make those relationships within um, the collection management software um, basically utilizing whatever metadata fields are there to make those relationships, put all that context around it, put in, you know, free text of just, you know, I, Peter, did this at this date with this vendor, at, you know, um, and just really build it out that way. But it would get the catalog right alongside everything else. Um, and then we would just, it would be evolving um, and its statuses would change just as the work, you know, sort of mm -hmm. lives its life in the collection. Great. I would also add in media conservation or with media artworks in general, we often have more than one master. So this is not to go into more details, but this is a place I think people can look on how um, these were solved for other artworks where there's more than one master. Okay, I went uh, way over time with this panel and uh, we could have gone much longer. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Sriva. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Emily. This has been a pleasure um, seeing you all and speaking with you.